I feel really lucky for lots of reasons, one of them being Valley House, which, <laughs> which helps me succeed in every possible way. So I want to thank them for everything they do for me. I can't thank them enough. But I also am really lucky because this is my favorite bunch of people to talk to, people who like to look at paintings, who know how to look at paintings, and who like to look at my paintings. <laughs> <laughs> so I feel especially lucky. All right, now for the quiz section of our, of our talk. Those of you who know what I'm doing, as soon as you know what I'm doing, tell us all. <laughs> simpler, simpler than that. So you're making a thing to look, to frame up. Bingo! <laughs> the, little, the little aspect ratio window. So if it were complete, if I made the next two cuts, it would look like this. This is the simplest way to make it. We teach people in school to make this. And you'll see why in a minute I'm not too sure that's a good idea. But it's like this, see? You go outside. <laughs> you know the, the picture changes a lot, whether you're going like this or like this. The students often say, well, you know, it didn't look like that when I did it. And I said, well, maybe it's because you did it like this. Uh, however, you know how it operates. It makes and a, an aspect that matches your, your canvas. So you try to make it match the size of the thing you're going to draw. So then you can look at something in nature to see how pieces of it would relate structurally to the ratio of the rectangle. If that's the reason that you do it, it seems like a really good idea. However, like a few tools in the world, it can lead you into terrible decisions. It can lead you into terrible ideas about what happens in a painting. Because if you're using this to see how the horizon interacts with one half of the height of the painting, good for you. If you're looking at this because you have a faulty idea of what a painting is, I'm going to use a friend of mine who actually spoke this to me. No one's in, not someone in this room. <laughs> who spoke this to me, uh, who got an idea that it's possible to get from this, but just from, just from civilization in general. What if you got the idea that this helped you just snip a painting out of nature and then know it and then paint it. He said to me, he said to me, you know, pictures, he called them, pictures aren't like music. Music is built up out of many components, time, certain notes. Music is built up out of things and then it becomes a work of music. But a picture is just painted. <laughs> and that's how somebody could get the idea that they had just snipped a picture out of something. There are many, there are many of my students who thought they had done that and, of course, could then never, ever construct a painting because that idea that the picture is a thing that exists before the painting is made. Maybe only in your head, but it exists. And that all you have to do is paint it leads to the notion, <laughs> to the notion that no painting is constructed, that it's not built, fought for, built up, revised. 
exactly like music. Um, and so when my students make this mistake, the mistake that they make is they start painting maybe, let's say, the, the big thing in the middle of the picture. <laughs> they start perhaps with the eye of the sitter with eyelashes. <laughs> and then they try to move that around until they get the whole picture done. As if all of the spots are already there, you only have to put the color where they are. That never works. The, the figure or the thing from reality or even from a structure of reality that might be called abstraction, it all has to be built up within that rectangle. Anyway, in case any of you, I just was afraid, in case any of you harbored the, the fallacy of the picture, dismiss it now because there is no such thing as a picture that gets painted. All paintings, from the caves on out, are all built up from things. Now, how they're built is, is the interesting part. I want to recommend to you, because I've recommended it to you sort of in the, in the invitation, uh, the work of a poet called Charles Tomlinson. And one of the best introductions to Charles Tomlinson I've ever seen is in How Poets See the World, which is by somebody I actually know, Willard Spiegelman, who taught at SMU. Uh, he was also the editor of Southwest Review. He's a brilliant scholar of poetry. This is actually Willard Spiegelman's best book. Um, if you read that sort of thing, he writes for the uh, Wall Street Journal about, he writes art reviews for the Wall Street Journal. Uh, he introduces this, this poet, Charles Tomlinson, who in, in a way is dependent on the ideas, the philosophical ideas of Turner and Ruskin in the 19th century, but is himself an abstract but very descriptive poet. In a way, he's a landscape poet. And it, I, I found Charles Tomlinson as so relevant to everything that I think about how a painting is constructed. Um, I, I want to just read you, in order to introduce it, the, a, a little piece of a Charles Tomlinson poem. Some people think he's chilly. That is, his choice of exact descriptive terms is, is <laughs> condensed, L like he's a descendant of Gerard Manley Hopkins. Very condensed, but, but very exact. And so it might kind of put you off the exactitude. Nevertheless, it's really good. Uh, and now the summit gives us all that lies below shows us the islands slide into their places beyond the shore and when the lights come on how all the other roads declare themselves garlanding their gradients to the sea how the road that brought us here has dropped away a half lost contour on a chart of lights the waters ripple and spread across the bay that's a very warm and descriptive Charles Tomlinson, some of them are cooler, as when he would describe a wave with a bunch of adjectives and nouns only. The thing I love about him is that he understands how one can approach things, but one cannot, one cannot entirely have all of them. Think about anything in reality that is interesting to you. A human body, a mountain, a shoe, whatever it is. If you, if you are looking at it, how much can you really describe? How much can you really, let's say, draw, paint, speak in poetry? The further you get into the reality of anything the more complicated it becomes. It becomes so complicated eventually that all your superficial first notices are worthless. 
and that you're inside it trying to discern the origin of its cells, how they relate to one another. How deep can you actually go into an object or a thing? You can, you can never do enough. So that what you have to do is hold at some level of description in which every piece of it becomes possible. And you don't go too far or don't go far enough. So the reason this is interesting is that Charles Tomlinson gets this idea from, of all places, weird old Ruskin in the 19th century. Now I know that Ruskin is in current movies, two that, I, that come to mind really recently. Effie Gray is one of them, where the guy Effie Gray marries is Ruskin. You know, you would never have anything to do with him after you had seen Effie Gray. Um, and, and the movie Turner, where he is a clown, a smart clown, but a clown. Um, none of this is true about Ruskin's mind. I don't know what was wrong with Ruskin's psyche. But where Ruskin is talking about painting, you have to stop getting fooled by the clown image and start thinking about what Ruskin really knows. And one of the smart things that Charles Tomlinson has repeatedly quoted in his lectures and says uh, over and over again in books is this quote from Modern Painters by Ruskin, where he's talking about time and space. Nature is never distinct and never vacant. She is always mysterious, but always abundant. You always see something, but you never see all. Hence in art, every space or touch in which we can see everything or in which we can see nothing is false. Let me read that again. <laughs> Hence in art, every space or touch in which we can see everything or in which we can see nothing is false. Nothing can be true which is either complete or vacant. Every touch is false, which does not suggest more than it represents. And every space is false, which represents nothing. So there is a, there is a place in, re, in relation to things at which you have to do all that is necessary, but never more. And there is a place in relation to things at which you must not do less than you must do. It's a level of approach to description that Charles Tomlinson is talking about when he's using words. Now, Charles Tomlinson actually made drawings, which is pretty remarkable. And I have a book which you might want to come look at later. Charles Tomlinson made drawings, even landscape drawings. The, the reproductions in this little old book are not fabulous. but. He had the same sort of understanding that I think I have finally maybe learned in painting, that, that there is a negotiated tentativeness about your seeing, not just mine, but yours, in which I can give you the whole thing if I don't give you too much of the wrong thing in which I describe things at the level in which they ought to be described and let you take care of the rest. It's apparently what he does in his drawings and in his paintings. Are there any questions about this? Shall I tell this over again? <laughs> <laughs> it, is, it is the key to the way, to the way these paintings are painted. You might say, uh, well, one person who was a friend of mine, David Searcy, said, there's only, was it four inches? Four inches of depth in any of these paintings. And I thought, well, yeah, in, maybe in the way I painted them, but not in the way you see them. The way you see them is different from the way I paint them. Well, made clear to me over and over again when people tell me what they are. And I'm very happy with what you say they are. 
Nevertheless, I didn't see that before you saw it. Um, what is there in the paintings is what I say in that artist statement on the back of this. If you want to know how they're painted, Every single one of them has a structure that is geometrical. And it's geometrical in relation to its geometrical shape. They're all rectangles or squares. And they all have geometrical structures that upon which everything is built. And some of those geometrical structures were originally even built out of color. Where I'm not talking about first there's a monochromatic schema upon which our things are hung. I mean, first, there's just a plan, and it's in the painting. It could be light and dark, it could be all one color. And then the rest of the work is done by color, which comes in and navigates the geometric plan. A, a, a term that I got lucky in learning from Derrida, who who I understand about 10% of the time he's talking. And, and that when I'm lucky. But the, the term, a second navigation of color, is exactly what's going on in the paintings. And that's why you read philosophers and poets, is because they have the terms by which you live. You're doing something, you're saying, I'm just, I'm doing that thing, you know, that thing. And then, they, then Derrida says, there's a second navigation by color. Ah, you say, that is that thing. So all of the paintings are built in exactly that way. And Tomlinson operates in a way that, that the paintings themselves operate when they're finished. That's why the two things are related to one another for me. Well, that was a big, long, deep. Stu uh, spiel, um, and I meant for it to be short because, of course, you're sitting there in a hot mask. <laughs> so, um, what about some questions? When you're reading, thank you, Derrida or a poet, and you come across a statement that crystallizes for you what you think you've been doing, does that help you develop further? Indeed. That crystalli crystallization. Yes, does, does, does the awakening through Derrida um, make me, make, do you mean does it make me better or does it make yes. me change? <laughs> uh, it might make, yes. I call it better, especially if I like the painting that arises out of the awakening through Derrida. Yes, I call it better, but it certainly is change. Because I now understand, I don't think the mechanism is an accident. You know you can look into things, but mostly not. Most of the time you have to know what you're doing. And uh, that's, why, that's why poets and painters are so essential. It's because I sometimes have words for the, for the strategies uh, but, like, never cross that line in that angle, never. That, that sort of strategy. The strategy that somebody needed explained the other day called rebatement. Anybody want me to say what rebatement is? Because mm -hmm. yeah. this room is full of rebatements, as skilled analysts all know. Um, actually, that the big white jug painting, which is rather large, is literally a rebatement. But while, but while you have that one to look at, there's also, because I'm up here, there's also this one to look at. So you could compare strategies in both cases. It's very simple. A rebatement is a square made by having the length of one side swing over and measure against the bottom. So the distance from here to here is the same as the distance from the top to the bottom. And you will notice this is a more subtle rebatement than the big 
than the big palm? The big palm in the white jug is a rebatement segment that is all palm. The rebatement segment section here is mostly what you might call yellow light. There's a lot of a yellow section that sort of cuts off there. And that makes this a square and the rest of the painting slightly longer. So rebatements divide rectangles into square plus, square plus anything. If you're familiar with the paintings of George Bellows, who is a great American hero, this was the rebatement king. Um, and, and George Bellows is a double rebatement guy. He loves to do this one and this one, and then have a corridor down the middle. So there will be two things. That section's one thing, that section's another thing, and then there's the section in the middle where the two rebatements didn't meet. That's what I mean by geometric organization. Uh, Pamela, okay, you can be first. Just tell me. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Like, take that painting, for example. Tell me how you started it and what was your strategy and why are the, is the animals there? And I mean, how did you kind of start from the beginning and end up with the pain, your, think, your thought process as you went through it? This one? Yes. Well, it, it act, I, this is actually one I remember pretty well because it's pretty recent. Um, I knew it had to be painted in some way this way, uh, although I didn't know when, that I was going back to the studio to do it on what day or what. But I knew it because um, in October, I was in the town where I was born, where Berendo Road happens to exist. And I drove along Berendo Road, the east side. I don't know if all of you know Roswell and Berendo Road. I mean, <laughs> why would you? But it was, it's a, it's a, long, it's a long, interesting road that runs, um, uh, that runs across the north end of town, really the farthest north when I was young. And it runs from five mile draw to Berendo Creek, hence the name, the it, Goat Creek or Pronghorn Creek. Is, okay, so I thought, well, Berendo Road's got to be painted. And it looked like this in October. However, uh, the, the things that, are, that I remember about its degree of agricultural emptiness are possibly no longer true. There's, there are certainly houses and pets and things in the way out on Berendo Road where there wouldn't have been in the time when one of my best friends lived there and I went over to her house all the time. Okay, so I, when, when I began to, to structure this rectangle without thinking that it was going to be Miranda Road, which is the essence, this is not a picture, <laughs> this is a painting. So I didn't know it was Miranda Road when I began it. I was working on the, that streak, that dark streak, and that yellow streak across the center. This is part of the beginning of the geometric structure of the painting. And this bookend down here, which is wider, and that shorter bookend down there. So it was a long, narrow thing with bookends. And then the, the top needed to hurt the yellow a little. The top, the blue, which is a wonderful pigment, from uh, Williamsburg called Sev, that blue could disrupt that yellow in a really good way. So there's a block of blue that sits above the horizontal. And after that, I said, oh, I remember that sky. That sky was there in October when I was there. And, uh, and that must be Berenda Road that I was driving along. What was that? What was that um, land like? What was that grass like? And um, 
so these, these sagey bushes were there to make a block. And then this, which is raw sienna, uh, was put on top of gray. There was gray painted here, then raw sienna put on top of it. And there was actually, there was actually this dog that I almost hit out, on, out there. Um, and so I let him sit down in the, in the raw sienna and have his portrait made. Um, acting, as I explained in a, uh, in a lecture before when I talked about these animals, acting as the introducer, the guy who comes downstage before the play begins and says, we're about to do Berendo Road for you now. <laughs> and um, it's, it's a place where I live. I, the dog, live and I control it. It's mine, but these other actors, these colors and these shapes are going to show you Berendo Road. So enjoy, he says. He's, and I think that the animals often act that, that way as the seducer who says, well, if you don't like this, you're going to like me. <laughs> so start here. Start here. Thank you. I think, was it Pamela? Did you? My question um, was about color. And um, I think Ruskin said the purest and most thoughtful minds are those that love color the most. And I was looking at all your skies and they're not always blue, but they're, you know, I just, your color theory and instinct is just so amazing. And I ever wonder if you start with, I really want to make a pink painting or I want to make a, I mean, does color ever be the driver with the, the paint or the structure more? I mean, you use color for your structure, but just wondering about your color. I can't, I mean, the painting can be started with the color. The, paint, uh, the painting can start as, as a color. I think it very often, I'm trying to think of a case in which it worked. Uh, well, the yellow, I mean, the yellow, the yellow worked, but um, uh, I don't know if I, if, you know, the yellow was not, it wasn't, given that the yellow would be there when the painting was finished. It so it, it is the geometric beginning and, and then of course it was the cause of the blue. Uh -huh. And then the blue and this are the cause of the green and then all the colors tell you what to do next. Every color calls up its associate. So you start with white, I mean you don't, you don't put a under... I do put, I, I most often put imprimaturas on the oh. painting. There's usually, for instance, in the one there with the little pale moon in the top, mm -hmm. you see that there is, there's orange underneath, no, especially, okay. I think, I'm not too sure, I know it's all under the, the blue, I don't, I think it might be under most of it, yes, it's under the yellow, mm -hmm. I don't know about, but yes, they usually have colors that have been um, used as the, as the spice inside the other paint, uh, other colors that overwhelm them. Thank you. Ah, uh, yes, Nancy. Back to Rebecca. <laughs> when you were discussing, oh, boy, <laughs> um, when you were discussing this painting and you talked about folding it over and making two squares. Is that the golden mean? Is that similar? I mean, that looks like... Well, it can result in a golden mean because I think a golden mean is 1, one to 1.6. Well, I have so no idea. So this would have to be the 1, and then this would have to be 1.6 long. So it depends on how long your rectangle is, whether it will be a golden mean or not. Okay. In, in, let's say, that long rectangle of the sculpture part, a rebatement would not result in a golden mean. It's much too long a format. Okay. This is just accidental, 
I mean, to my eye, that looks like that might be the golden mean. Well, I want to, I want to get as close to inevitability in the composition as I can. And of course, that would, that would kind of, to a human, look inevitable, golden right. means. Okay. But it, I, didn't, I don't do golden mean numbers. I only, I only operate in relation to the aspect that I have. And in most of these UPOs that I prefer, it's 26 by 40. So I have this rectangle, and I have to work out the way things fit. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Can you explain your um, your one on on the right hand side there, the divided one? How do you com how do you come up with that combination? And I love that one of the images from the right looks like it's spilling over onto the left one. So. Can yes. you explain your process in that? Well, as, it, as is usual, it isn't, it's not a picture. <laughs> so I didn't know what it would be. And I, was in, I knew it was going to be double. It was going to be this size. That, those things were side by side. But I began this painting as, as an attempt to learn, to do an homage to Cy Twombly, which is hard for me to do. I mean, I love little pieces of Cy Twombly's, but not the whole thing. And then, I'm getting to where I like the whole of Cy Twombly's. But, so I began and failed. It's, it, this is, it got too dense and organized. And his organizations are not at all the same as mine. They are much more frisky. And, um, so, after, after a great deal, especially of, of this red, after this red had been done, I, I then said, well, that has to be, that's too dense and mean. It has to be held back by something that is uh, sweeter. And so I, I drew in this pink color what is essentially a kind of Dutch Dutch flower still life with irises and, and all those things. In pink, the blue was already there. And then I thought, oh, well, this red needs to visit the blue. Uh, so this red has to come visiting. This was actually exactly this color, this color. And so some, the roses within the Dutch still life get painted as roses. And then the green of the green of this gets drawn and then the green goes and draws the green with the red in the roses. And then this is too aggressive and so that gets taken down with kind of like mm, the color of custard. And then I say, well, look at what's happening. There is this, there is this, this manic or frenzied work state. And then there is this dream state. So I think this is awake and asleep. So I wrote awake and asleep. And then somebody, or maybe more than one somebody, several somebodies at the opening told me I was wrong, <laughs> that they were backwards. <laughs> that this is asleep, and that's awake. <laughs> with, I'm thrilled with that analysis, because that means that this actually is a part of somebody's seeing, that they're, that they're in seeing into the painting their state of awake and asleep, who am I to argue? Perhaps I got it backwards. Yes. I'm not a painter, so forgive me for for asking kind of about obtuse questions. Well, you, not to be a painter means you're not competing. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of good. <laughs> I'm thinking of I'm thinking of Michelangelo, who, when asked about how he sculpted, he said, "Easy, you just remove the parts of the marble that are not the part of the." Uh, 
sculpture that, that that's there. So my question really is, it, your process, are you making the painting or is the painting as you're working revealing itself to you? Does that make that question make I, this sense? This is a really good question. It certainly is not revealing itself because it's not that generous. <laughs> because paintings just don't show themselves off like that. But it is making demands. It is calling out necessities. If you did that, you now cannot do that, but you could do these three things. Or you could wipe that out and do that. I, the yellow, must have the blue now. If you don't put it there, you're going to have to put it there later. <laughs> so now, the, it is, it's making demands, but the demands are uh, multifaceted. They are not one demand. Now, now green, what green? There are only four million colors of green. How, transparent, not, bluish, yellowish, dull, bright. What green do you need? It's the painting, and as, as I tell my students, the pigments are much older than we are. They know much more about themselves than we do. You have to listen to them because they will not cooperate if you don't obey them. Yes? I uh, love your landscapes, but I also love your, some of your earlier paintings of the animals. Mm -hmm. Very simple and very whimsical and delightful. How, um, how did you come upon these? And you choose such wonderful, happy animals. Mm -hmm. So, um, and the painting's very simplistic. Mm -hmm. And you've gotten away from that, but I love those too. It, it, well, for instance, it, you, I mean, the camera that is filming us cannot see this, but you and I can. Um, straight back, there is that snowy owl with the garden with snowy owl. It's way back in the other room. Okay. And the snowy owl is big and schmooey looking, big and kind of lumpish. But it is one of those animals. And it is the simple version. I mean, it's more, it's more the dominated by line in the painting yeah. than, in, than by chunks of color. Um, so there are a few of those in these. I, I don't know where the funny one that is the um, jack-in-the-box went. Oh, that back room. It, it's very much an, an animal mechanism. So uh, I, I, I have this attitude toward the living beings that is very similar to what I said about the degree of ability to approach a thing. A and that is, I think I choose animals that I can approach with some kind of competence and completeness because in a way, their form is beautiful. Their form is sort of universal. The problem that I would have with painting a portrait is the problem that Tomlinson made clear to me is that in approaching a thing, especially a human being, the, the looking at that human thing becomes so complicated after a while that you no longer can handle it as a simple form. It becomes, it has a back on its head. You have to somehow reveal that the head has a back, that it's not a pie plate with features. Um, that inside, it, ha it hasn't, it has, it shifts all the time with its feelings. It also has things it's hiding from you. It has teeth that shape its mouth. It's, it's so complicated that I have not the descriptive terms to handle that degree of thingness. But the animals that I that I see dogs because they're with us all the time and they are so varied cats to a certain extent 
um, uh, things like bears, which are essentially large dogs. Um, well, <laughs> same genealogy, same, same, same. Um, they have a shape that hides enough of its interior complexity that I don't get into it. That I don't say, bear, your teeth are shaping your mouth, but I cannot, how can I understand the teeth? I, the bear is all smooth. Well, you're painting at the Bush Library of the verbs, and it's just Thank you. beautiful. And um, feels different from these, very different. Um, and artists have these phases. You, you know, you only love blue period Picassos, not rose period Picassos. That's just it's a nice transition. <laughs> yes. <laughs> now you have the mic. Here it's you. Uh, you speak a lot about values, and uh, it reminds me of like a moral structure that's inherent in the painting, and you have a very personal, um, I say it's specific to painting, moral structure. Do you have regrets after developing a relationship with these paintings, selling them? I have no regrets. <laughs> um, on the other hand, they, they have a task to do. They have a job which is to go out and act on other eyes, to act in your life and do something that you and that painting can do together that has nothing to do with me. You, because some relevance in it caused you to take that painting home. And then you say, I see that thing, I see that thing that is so important to me. Maybe I, I built it. I built it and painted it in, in a way that let you see it, but I didn't know. So I regard them as um, disciples, not for me, but for the world, that go out and do their work. I don't want them back home trying to work on me again. <laughs> Here and then there. You were, you were mentioning that you're a native of Roswell. Uh, growing up in New Mexico, what, influence, what influenced you the most among the New Mexican painters? Uh, people like Raymond Johnson, Howard Cook, uh, the five painters from Santa Fe, the Taos founders, uh -huh. all of that. What struck you as being uh, important to your development as a painter? So many things, so many are New Mexico. Well, you know, Victor Higgins, when I was, when, when I was 20, was to me the, the master god of New Mexico painting. Any Victor Higgins is, it's, it's built like architecture. But um, in my hometown, there was Peter Hurd, and Henriette Wyeth, who was the daughter of N.C. Wyeth, who was Peter Hurd's wife. And, um, and Peter Hurd was, of course, the master of an extremely delicate egg tempera technique and a and very methodical painter and very successful and a landscape painter. Of, I, I actually regarded him more as a figure of drama since at various you know, when I was, say, three or four years old, dramatic events regarding Peter Hurd were, uh, erupted in our lives, and, and I was just watching. Oh, oh. Uh, and I'll tell you those events some other time, <laughs> because they're scandalous. <laughs> uh, I, and then, then there was uh, a distant, but like a goddess, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe, who my parents, because they were, they were uh, the kind, you know, honky intelligentsia, the, 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 they, were, they were from other states, and they loved New Mexico, and they, they, were, they, they taught, and they had been to graduate school, and so they knew all the, all the 
contemporary and terribly important things. So um, we, went, we would go to openings, let's say, uh, occasionally in Santa Fe, or I don't <coughs> remember being at one in Taos, but maybe, of Georgia O'Keeffe's. And I remember denouncing a Georgia O'Keeffe painting when I was about five or six, again, <laughs> maybe four. Uh, I, was in a, I was in front of a big painting that actually looked to me like a failure in terms of the Charles Tomlinson dictum. That is, it didn't do enough. It, ha it was a big thing, maybe it was a woman, I don't know what it was, it was a big thing that was not, uh, it was not available to the viewer in a thorough enough way. And the paint itself was not interesting. I'm saying these things in now terms, but as a four-year-old, I just said, well, it's one of the worst paintings I have ever seen, <laughs> which would count up to about 10 paintings, except for the ones in the picture books, of which I had seen very many Renaissance paintings. So I was standing there. My mother was at the back of the room. We were the only people in the room, except for one who entered the room. And a voice said, Myra, you have a most unpromising child. <laughs> And, and that was George O'Keefe. <laughs> so I began on the wrong foot with George O'Keefe. Later in graduate school, we used to get to take her paintings back from University of New Mexico to her house in Taos. And I would always sort of lurk by the van as she talked to the, to the guys she liked, men, uh, who were delivering the painting because I was afraid she'd recognize me. <laughs> um, and there were lots of other, there were lots of other painters. Henriette Weiss was, a, was an amazing still life painter. Amazing. Scary good. Do you still dislike those particular paintings? Oh yes. Yeah. Yes, and I now approve of George O'Keefe in general. <laughs> uh huh. In general, yeah. She gets better as I get older. <laughs> well, thank. Oh, one more. Blue. The one for uh, blue. You describe Sev. Sev. It's called. It's it's undoubtedly Thalo in its origins. It's, it's, Williamsburg makes all these. It's a, it's a, it's that color. It, it isn't as dark as you expect phthalo to be. So I think it's, Williamsburg grinds, grinds these colors. I think it's phthalo, but it's kind of pale. Sev, like the color of Sev porcelain edges. Oh. S-E-V-R-E-S. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. What's the reason for your um, Yopan paper? Um, I think it falls into the, um, the color that you were talking about and how it sets up. Your colors are so beautiful and so pure, they don't ever fade. Is that why you use Well, they the paper? don't fade because they're oil paint. <laughs> well, but, <laughs> but they, do, they would sink in. Is that the surface that's right. that There's you no choose? Sinking. It's so beautiful. I, I like Yupo. I like it because I, it is because I don't have to gesso it in order to paint oil on it, because I don't have to protect Yupo from solvents, because Yupo is impervious to these things. It's almost impervious to everything, but it was made for watercolor. So everything sticks to it fine. I've been painting on it for almost 20 years. Nothing bad happens to the Yupo. That's a good test. Um, it is light. I don't, I don't have to stretch it. It's hard when I staple it on the wall. I like hard surfaces. I don't like springy surfaces. Uh, I can roll up a big one and put it in the back of my car. There are three big ones in the back of my car now. I don't have to worry about, about carrying big paintings around. It's the reason why painting on canvas was invented, of course, was it so you could roll them up and carry them across town. But now everybody's forgotten that, and they keep not unstretching the canvas. Mm -hmm. But in Yupo, 
it's, it's easy. Besides, it's beautiful, silky surface. Is it paper? It's, it's polypropylene. It, it is not paper. It's, so is it's, there, it's, there's something similar at the hardware store you can buy. It has, comes in very similar feel. Like acetate. Maybe. Acetate is, is um, not as enduring as, but it's very nice. It looks like paper. It doesn't, the, these, these, this size is thicker than the big ones. The big ones are thinner UPO. I'm not as fond of the big ones. It's harder to handle. Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you're considering painting on UPO and then you get some and then you fail, um, keep on because people say to me over and over again, I tried it. It didn't work. I can't do it. <laughs> but it takes a long time to get the UPO to do what you want it to do. Just a lot of fiddling around with it. Then it works as well as any other thing that you paint on. Yes. Do you work on one painting at a time? I work on perhaps three or four paintings at a time, depending on how big. And I'm, and I'm soon to move to a new studio. Please knock on magic wood right now for me. That lease may be signed any day. If so, I will have much more room than before. Yes. Let me ask one more. Uh, my wife and I have a Fred Nagler painting, uh, which was uh, won a, an award from the National Academy. And uh -huh. there was a show of his work at the Biblical Arts Museum years and years ago. And Fred came up to us and he said, uh, I understand you own that painting. And we said, yes. He said, you know, painters are like baseball players. They don't always hit a home run but I hit a home run on that painting. Uh, Do you have a home run here that you want to pick out that uh, you like best of all? So, actually, I'm, uh, I think a lot of these are in a very good category. A lot of these are in, yeah. You know the thing that, that for me is the home run of this show is that, is that 10 painting wall that Ben Bascom of Valley House hung in the other room? The, those landscapes in two rows. The wall itself is kind of news about those paintings. Those paintings, some, one of my friends said to me, God, the museum should just buy the wall. It <laughs> should never be taken apart now. <laughs> but they didn't hear that. <laughs> yes? When do you know your painting is done? I, am, I really don't know. Well, she says, when do I know when my painting is done? Uh, it's the Charles Tomlinson rule. Don't, don't put in stuff that is not descriptive of the image that you are making. Don't, don't doll it up with extra goop. It doesn't mean that, if, that paintings can't have one or two marks more. I don't think that old thing that a painting rises at its finality <laughs> when not one more mark can be made and not one mark can be removed. Uh, that's, who made that up? Uh, there's, something happens, a painting, something gets lost, the painting is almost just as good as it ever was. You, you could always, and the, the, uh, the great thing is that Bonard used to go into the museum and paint on his own paintings <laughs> with a little kit like this. <laughs> and they, they had to ban him from museum. So, you can change your mind and say, well, I don't like that leg when we have to, we have to make that one yellow. I, I think that little things can happen. Maybe that's part of the magic is that it's just at the place where you can't quite add something. Yeah. Yeah. I, gotcha. I was wondering if you 
dealt with sketching a lot in charcoal or graphite, or if you use things like Photoshop to create, just to get your mind going at any time? I never draw on the paintings except with the paint. But I, I, I do, but I get my mind going in the paintings. I do draw, but sometimes I draw animals. Uh, my drawings, or I, make, or I make books and fill them with color things, but it's not nearly as big an enterprise for me as the painting. So does the color, the color really helps you rather than like a graphite or a charcoal or a black and white idea? Well, I can make black and white paintings, which are also colors. Um, there's one in the other room. Right. But uh, yes, um, uh, the color is, is, the f is the way the painting is adjusted into its own self or navigated. It, the color is the thing that makes it. I think we had... One question right there. Yes, I there. was wondering, Mary, I know you've been a teacher uh, for many years, and uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts on what you think uh, teaching contributed to your uh, work as an artist. Well, uh, you know, by her, by her students, she'll be taught. Um, <laughs> yes. At first, I, at first in art history, I was just staying one chapter ahead of them. <laughs> that was all that seemed required to me. <laughs> that was the biggest thing I could do. Was <laughs> the, what, what will happen in the next century, Professor? The next century? Oh, it will be exciting. <laughs> yeah. um, but in fact, they, they kept they, their problems. It's not that they have great solutions. I'm not suggesting that. One in a hundred students. Have an, have, are like the poet and the philosopher who have a solution for you and it's already there, that's rare. They have problems, and the problems are the interesting part. You say, how come this guy cannot get this? And you have to figure out a, a, a way by which he can work into getting it. It's more like, it's more like um, management in business than it is like painting, it's, it's psychology and uh, sympathy with the struggle. Sometimes they have great problems that teach me things, but it, it's more trying to solve their problems that I get the answer to mine. Thank you so much.